Hong Kong Diploma of Secondary Education, 2020. English Language, Paper 3. Listening and Integrated Skills. Instructions to Candidates. You should have on your desk a Part A Question Answer Book, a Part B1 Data File, with a Part B1 Question Answer Book inserted, and a Part B2 Data File, with a Part B2 Question Answer Book inserted. Do not open them until you are told to do so. I repeat, do not open the question answer books or the data files until you are told to do so. Now, write your candidate number in the space provided on page 1 of your Part A question answer book. Now look at the Part A Question Answer Book. Check that the Part A Question Answer Book has no missing pages. Look for the words, End of Part A, Now Go On to Part B, on the last page. Now, stick your barcode labels in the spaces provided on pages 1, 3, and 5. Close your Part A question answer book when you have finished. Now look at your Part B1 data file. Take out the inserted Part B1 question answer book. Check that your Part B1 data file has no missing pages. Look for the words, This is the last page of the Part B1 data file on the last page. Now write your candidate number in the space provided on page 1 of your Part B1 Question Answer Book. Check that the Part B1 Question Answer Book has no missing pages. Look for the words end of Part B1 on the last page. Now, stick your barcode label in the space provided on page 1. Close the Part B1 question answer book when you have finished. Now look at your Part B2 data file. Take out the inserted Part B2 question answer book. Check that the Part B2 data file has no missing pages. Look for the words, This is the last page of the Part B2 data file on the last page. Now write your candidate number in the space provided on page 1 of your Part B2 question answer book. Now check that the Part B2 question answer book has no missing pages. 
Look for the words, end of part B2, on the last page. Now stick your barcode labels in the spaces provided on pages 1 and 3. Close the Part B2 question-answer book when you have finished. You are reminded that all examination materials will be played once only. This paper is divided into two parts, Part A and Part B. For Part A, you should use a pencil to answer all questions. For Part B, you can use a pen or a pencil. Put up your hand now if you have any difficulties. It is not possible to handle complaints after you have taken the paper. The listening component is about to begin. Keep your earphones on until you are told to take them off. Open your Part A question-answer book at page 3. Part A is about to begin. Part A In Part A, you will have a total of four tasks to do related to the theme of exploration. Follow the instructions in the question-answer book and in the recording to complete the tasks. You will find all the information you need in the question-answer book and the recording. You now have two minutes to familiarize yourself with tasks one to four. Task 1 Julia and Mark are looking at the web page of World Watch Travel. Listen to their conversation and complete the information in the spaces below. The first one has been provided as an example. You now have 30 seconds to study the task. At the end of the task, you will have one minute to tidy up your answer.
Hey, I found this website about expeditions. Let's see what it says. Have you ever wanted to become an explorer and discover new animals? Now you can with World Watch Travel. With World Watch Travel, you go on an eco-friendly adventure to a protected part of the Brazilian rainforest. Oh, it's in Brazil! Wow, it sounds amazing. When can we go? Well, let me see. Hmm, it says here you can book an expedition in the summer, and each one lasts for six nights. Do you wander around the rainforest by yourselves for six nights? No, you go in a group, and um, groups are made up of eight to ten students from different countries. Eight to ten students in a group—that's quite a lot. Safety in numbers, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose so. And wait, how much does it cost? Let's see. It says for students. It's seven hundred and fifty U.S. dollars. How much is that in Hong Kong dollars? I think it's around six thousand Hong Kong dollars. Six thousand? Well, it's not cheap, but it's a holiday of a lifetime. All right, let's see what they actually do. Can you click on main activity? Sure. Okay. So the main activity is. Studying small animals. So what do we have to do? Well, it says here, you will set up traps. Oh my goodness, that means we have to catch real animals in traps and see what we find. I hope there are no big spiders. Okay, what do we do with the animals once they are in the traps? All right, let me read. So apparently, we need to check their weight and general health. Right. So we check to see how much they weigh, and also see if they're healthy. Sounds okay. Yeah, sounds fun. Hmm. What about facilities? What kind of facilities do they offer? Right. So it looks like you stay in a lodge, and it looks like each lodge has a toilet at least and a shower. Well, that's good news. It's definitely a plus that there's a washroom, and it isn't like miles away. So, is there a kitchen? Hmm, it doesn't look like it. So, where are we supposed to cook? Do you think? That's what I was wondering. Hmm, but there is a lounge, so you can hang out with the rest of your group in the lounge if you want to. Okay, that's good. Oh, but look. There's no hot water. That can be very pleasant. I suppose the water's warm enough for a shower. Well, it all sounds amazing, even with cold water. Yeah, I agree. Oh, here's a map of the campsite locations. You can see where there are interesting places, and where new species have been found. Blue Camp's where the exploration starts. It's the most northern campsite. You can see here on the top left of the map. They say a lot of new insects have been discovered here. The next one on the list is Red Camp. It's quite far away from Blue Camp, on the other side of the map. Oh yes, over here on the right. Yes, there's a veterinary center here, so that's where they take any sick animals they find. This area is where new species of butterfly have been found. The next one's Green Camp. It's right in the middle of the map. It says you can often see turtles here. The last one's Yellow Camp, over in the southeast. Hmm. I'm not sure if it's a good idea to visit this one. Look at the kinds of animals that live there. Yeah, I wouldn't mind the monkeys, but I don't think I'd fancy meeting crocodiles. No, neither would I. Oh, look, there are some reviews. Oh dear, this one isn't very good. It says, "I thought this would be a relaxing holiday, but I was so tired at the end of it, I needed another one." This was not a holiday; it was paying to work for someone else. 
paying to work for someone else. That's a terrible way to look at it. Oh gosh, what an idiot! Didn't they read the website? Here's a better one. The best thing about World Watch Camp was the delicious local food. Everything was fresh and delicious. Ah, that's why there's no kitchen. There must be a canteen instead. That is the end of task one. You now have one minute to tidy up your answers. Task two. Jason is a documentary maker. He is interviewing Dr. Anita Carter for a documentary about the exploration of the ocean. Listen to the interview and write the information in the spaces below. The first one has been provided as an example. You now have thirty seconds to study the task. At the end of the task, you will have one minute to tidy up your answers. Good afternoon, Doctor Carter. Good afternoon, Jason. Now, Doctor Carter, you're part of an American research team that's discovered new fish in the Alonzo Trench, one of the deepest parts of the ocean. Yes, that's right. So, how long have you been researching this area? Well, our research began last spring, so we've been documenting the area、mm, for about a year now. And what? Brings you to this part of the ocean, is it because there are lots of endangered species here? No, actually, no. It's simply because we don't know much about it yet, even though it is actually quite near the coast. Right. So there's still a lot more to be discovered.、Mm, that's right. We always want to find out more. So can you tell us about what you've discovered so far? Well, there's so much going on under the surface of the ocean. So much to find out, but I suppose the main discovery was a new species of snailfish. Snailfish? That's quite an unfortunate name. Yes, but they're a very special creature. I have a map here.、Um, it's not to scale, but it gives you an idea of where we found the fish. Before we could only go down to around three thousand meters, but now we can go much further. I mean, we've reached depths of between six thousand five hundred meters and seven thousand five hundred meters below sea level, and that's where we found the snailfish. That's quite far down, isn't it? Yes, it really is. We've also got some images of the animals we found. Great. Let's have a look. Hmm. Okay. So this one here is the snailfish. You can see they have very soft bodies, which are quite long. They have two sets of fins, larger ones near the front of their bodies, behind their heads. In this image, you can just see the ones at the front. Oh, they do look like fish, 
but they don't really look like snails, do they? They don't carry a shell on their backs. <laughs> no, they don't. What's this one here? It looks quite alien. No, it's from Earth. This is another species we filmed. They are long-legged isopods, and they're about the size of a human hand. They look a lot like spiders. They have very small bodies and eight long, very thin legs. Yes, they do look like spiders. The third interesting creature、uh, you can see here was a type of sea cucumber called a sea pig. A sea pig? That's an even more unfortunate name than snailfish. Indeed, but again, they're quite special. This animal was observed in a different part of the ocean, but we used the same technology to film it. They have several short legs on the underside of their bodies, and usually four legs that extend from the top. This one has just two. You can see here that all these legs help them climb over rocks. Yes, that's extraordinary. So those aren't antennae on the top of its head. No, those are more legs. Right. Let's go back to the snailfish. They look very fragile. Are they? Well, they are very delicate animals, but they do have hard parts. Actually, their teeth and ear bones are the hardest structures in their bodies. Oh, that's interesting. I thought their spines would be the toughest part, as you can see them in the picture. So they have hard teeth, you say? Yes, they use them to scare off other fish. Right. So I get it why they would need hard teeth. But why do they need ear bones? Well, they need ear bones for balance, just as humans do. So the ear bones help them stay upright in the water? Yeah, basically. Without the ear bones, they would have a hard time swimming in the right direction. And what about the rest of their bodies? Well, they're covered with a skin that looks a bit like jelly. This means that they cannot survive for long when they're brought to the surface. Why can't they survive? Well, it's really difficult to maintain the conditions they need to survive on the surface. It's easy enough to make the tank dark and to give them the right kind of food, but they need very cold temperatures and very high pressure. Once they're brought to the surface, it's too warm and the water pressure's too low. So without these two things, they just die. Oh, really? That's a shame. That must make your job more difficult. Do you get quite frustrated? Well, it's incredibly exciting to be able to study them in their natural habitat, but it's unfortunate that they don't survive their journey to the surface. Okay, Dr. Carter. Thank you very much. That is the end of Task Two. You now have one minute to tidy up your answers. Task three. Julia and Mark are at a history museum with a museum guide. Listen to their discussion as they visit an exhibition and complete the notes below. The first one has been provided as an example. You now have thirty seconds to study the task. At the end of the task, you will have one minute to tidy up your answers.
The Merlin expedition to northeast Siberia, led by Captain James Merlin, was one of history's most famous expeditions. Unfortunately, it was also one of the most deadly. One hundred and seventy-nine crew members began the journey, but none survived. One hundred and seventy-nine people died. That's awful. The Admiralty started planning for the mission in 1819, and the ship, which was called the Shadow, finally began its journey three years later in 1821. Here you can see a picture of the Shadow, and what experts think happened to it on the ice. The ship used technology which was very modern for that time. The main piece of technology was a steam engine that had originally been built to power trains. This meant that it could travel quite quickly. So, a steam engine would that have helped them sail even when there was no wind? Is that the idea? Yeah, that's right. It was very powerful. Here's an example of a similar steam engine. You can see how impressive it is. Wow! Yeah. Another aspect of technology that was quite advanced at the time was a special heating system. This heating system—it was inside the ship—was powered by steam as well, and it would help the crew keep warm even in the freezing cold. Right. Yeah. Right. Moving on, here we can see what the ship's galley would have looked like. What's a galley? Is that like a kitchen? Yeah. I think so. Whoa, that's a lot of soup. Yes, you can see the food's mostly in cans, right? It all looks the same. Do you think they got tired of always eating the same thing? Well, it might have been boring, but it did save space on the ship. They had lots of people to feed, so they needed food that wouldn't take up too much room. It must have been very cramped. And what did they do all day? Wouldn't they get bored just looking out at icebergs? Well, we know that to keep everyone entertained, the crew would put on a show once a month. Oh, so they would be actors and singers when they weren't working. Yes, this was a common thing aboard ships at the time. They would put on a show to help keep the crew members happy, and also give them something to do, a bit like us watching TV shows today. I have a question. Weren't they afraid of going to Siberia? I mean, I would have been. It probably would have seemed a long, scary journey to us, but the crew thought there was nothing to worry about. They believed they were well prepared for the journey, as they thought they had everything they would need. What they didn't realize was that there was a problem with the food. Really? What happened? Well, there was a problem with the manufacturer. They needed eight thousand cans of food, and they needed the order to be ready in only two months. This wasn't much time, but the company that made the order was very experienced, so that wasn't a problem in itself. However, the food that the company bought to put in the cans wasn't of a very high standard. This meant that although the ship got their order in time. What they ended up with was a lot of bad food. Some of the canned vegetables were rotten. Some of the meat would have been okay for animals, but not for people. Previously, experts thought that the cans had been made with dangerous metals, but we now know that that isn't true. That wasn't the problem. So, is that how they died? Well, we know that the ship became trapped in ice. And most experts believe that it remained trapped there for three winters. Most experts think they were there for three winters. Does that mean no one's really sure about what happened? Well, we don't know for sure what happened, but we do know that none of them survived. We also know that their health was affected by a number of problems. One was the quality of their diet; they simply didn't get enough vitamins. This is because, as I mentioned before, they weren't eating enough high-quality meat. Okay, so not enough vitamins. What else? 
They were stuck on the ice for so long, and the human body needs a huge number of calories when it's that cold. But they just didn't get enough, so they starved. They just didn't get enough calories to survive. Whoa, it's a grim story. Yes, it really must have been terrible. Hmm. You said they found the ship in 2010. Where? Well, it's kind of strange, actually. The name of the area was almost the same as that of the ship. It was found in an area called Shadow Bay. Oh, that's a creepy coincidence. The Shadow Shadow Bay. Another strange thing is how they found it. The story goes that a local fisherman had a dream about a ship caught in a huge snowstorm on the ice. The fisherman was so upset by the dream that he felt he had to go there and check for himself. And when he did, he found an old ship in exactly the same spot where he'd seen it in his dream. So he called the authorities, who eventually confirmed that yes, it was the shadow. He was right. Wow, that's amazing! Imagine seeing it in a dream. That is the end of task three. You now have one minute to tidy up your answers. Task four. Listen to Modern Explorer, a podcast about modern day exploration. You will hear historian Anna Connor introducing an audio book. After you hear part of the audio book, Anna will give her opinion on the audio book. Please note that you do not need to answer in complete sentences. You now have thirty seconds to study the task. At the end of the task, you will have three minutes to tidy up your answers. Good morning, and welcome to the program. I'm Anna Connor, and you're listening to Modern Explorer. Today, we're going to hear from an explorer called Peter Dales, who claims to have discovered a lost monument, the Temple of the Leopard God. Let's hear some parts of his new audio book, The Rise of the Leopard God. Chapter One: Through the Jungle. On the first day of our search, my team and I left the jungle campsite with two experienced guides. They knew the area well because their families had lived nearby for generations, and they had grown up hearing stories of the leopard god. Their ancestors had the greatest respect for the leopard god because the leopard would have been the most powerful animal in the jungle. Luckily, we didn't see real live leopards. We did, however, meet some very curious wild animals on our journey. Monkeys followed us in the trees above our heads, and small deer came out to watch us. 
how would they know to be scared of us if they had never seen humans before? This was a clear sign that people had not been in this area for a very, very long time. We continued on our journey into the valley, fighting our way through the jungle. By late afternoon, though, we'd hit a problem. The guides said that they were unwilling to take us any further, claiming that the area was unsafe. They said that a recent earthquake had made the area dangerous, and so it was unsafe to go on. This seemed suspicious, and it seemed to me that there may have been another reason why they didn't want to continue. The Leopard God. I actually think that they were afraid of making the Leopard God angry. According to local legend, disturbing the Leopard God could have very serious consequences. That's why they would not go on. We continued alone. Chapter 2 The Statue On our second day, after hours of climbing through the dense jungle, we eventually reached a flat area. Was this the site of the temple? The temple was said to have been guarded by a huge statue of the leopard god, made entirely of blue stone. Suddenly, we made a remarkable discovery. One colour stood out between the green leaves and brown soil. The large pieces of blue stone were unmistakable. Then, all around on the ground, we began to see more and more blue stones. This was it. The lost statue of the leopard god. As we carefully removed plants and dirt, we uncovered a wonderful surprise. Under the plants was a gold coin. We began searching. That day alone, we uncovered more than 70 priceless gold coins, scattered all around the immediate area. There was so much more to explore. We vowed that one day we would return. Chapter 3 The Research The next step was to take some evidence back to our research centre in London. Some historians may not agree with removing artefacts, but we had two very good reasons for doing so. Firstly, we needed to study the items carefully, and the only place we could do that was in the lab. So we packed the objects up into boxes and shipped them all back to our lab in London for analysis. The second reason is particularly important to this discovery. There could always be an earthquake, and if that happened, then the site would have been destroyed. We knew we had to take the items we found to safety, so that they wouldn't be lost if an earthquake struck the area again. OK, so that was an extract from Peter Dale's new book, The Rise of the Leopard God. Well, what can I say? This is all rubbish. There are so many problems here, I just don't know where to start. Firstly, and most importantly, Peter should not say he discovered the temple. He didn't discover it because the local people already knew about it. The local people knew about the temple because their families had always lived in the area. Just because someone from Europe went there to see it for themselves, it does not mean that no one else knew about it. And for goodness sake, why does he keep repeating that there is so much gold? What does he think's going to happen? Now that we know where the temple is, anybody can go there and take the objects. And that would be a disaster for the local community and for historical research. And Peter Dales really needs to remember what the true value of studying historical items is. It is not how much they are worth. 
It is not what the objects are made of that's important. It's how people use these things in their lives. That's what's important. For instance, why were there so many gold coins at the temple? What does this tell us about how people use the temple? If we find the answers to these questions, this will give us a much better picture of how people lived in the past. That is the end of Task 4 and of Part 3A. You now have three minutes to complete your answers to Task 4 and to tidy up all your other answers. Part B. Look at page 2 of your data file. Situation. You are Nico Lin. You work for StarPod, an organization that promotes space exploration and runs adventure camps for children. You are an assistant to the director of StarPod, Miss Ellen Ochoa. Miss Ochoa has asked you to do some tasks. You will listen to a recording of a StarPod podcast in which Ellen Ochoa speaks to Captain Trillian Choi and Professor Marvin Adams. Take notes under the appropriate headings. Before the recording is played, you will have five minutes to study the question-answer book and the data file to familiarize yourself with the situation and the tasks. Complete the tasks by following the instructions in the question-answer book 
and on the recording. You will find all the information you need in the question answer book, the data file, and on the recording. As you listen, you can make notes on page 3 of the data file. You now have five minutes to familiarize yourself with the question answer book and the data file.
The recording is about to begin. Turn to page 3 of the data file. Good afternoon. So we've got lots of interesting things to talk about today on the Star Pod podcast. And with me are two special guests. Our first guest is Captain Trillian Choi, who I'm sure needs no introduction. Hi, everyone. And my other guest is Professor Marvin Adams, an astronomer at the Hong Kong Space Observatory. Lovely to be back again, Ellen. OK, so one of the most exciting activities at our adventure camp is the Mars Experience Room, where our children get to feel what it would be like to be on Mars. And it is quite a dangerous place, Mars, from what I can gather. So my first question is, Trillian, what are the dangers of being on Mars and what would kill you? Well, lots of things. <laughs> but one of the first things is there is no oxygen on Mars. So without oxygen, you can't breathe, of course, and so you would die. Gosh, no oxygen? Not able to breathe? That's scary. Yeah, it certainly is. So that means you can't walk around on the surface of Mars without a spacesuit. Right, got it. But what about the temperature on Mars? I've heard it's very cold. Is that right? Yes. Mars is too cold for humans, definitely. Again, you wouldn't survive. You would freeze to death unless you had a spacesuit on. That sounds terrible. Yeah, so basically, you would really need to wear a spacesuit at all times. But even then, if you were wearing a spacesuit, Mars would still be a pretty dangerous place to be. Really? How so? What other dangers would there be? Well, there are dust storms. Dust storms? That doesn't sound so bad. How are dust storms dangerous? Well, for one thing, it would be very easy to get lost in one of these dust storms. <laughs> mm, getting lost on Mars would be very bad news, I'm sure. Getting lost on any planet is bad news, even Earth. <laughs> Good point. Let's carry on with the topic of planets. Another of our activities at Adventure Camp is about the planet Tarkov. Now, Marvin's a bit of an expert on Tarkov and helped us design the problem-solving activity we run at the camp. So why did you choose Tarkov for the activity? A good question, Ellen. So imagine, here is a planet which has incredibly extreme seasons, much, much more extreme than anything we would find anywhere on Earth. OK, so what would that mean if you were living on Tarkov? Well, on Tarkov, in the summer the temperatures are so high that the oceans boil. And this produces huge amounts of steam. So if you were on Tarkov, the steam would kill you in an instant. Jeepers! That's terrible! Killed by boiling oceans? Ugh. So that's summer on Tarkov, but what about winter? What happens then? I'm imagining it's not going to be good. Yeah, you're right there. Well, the temperatures would sink so low that the oceans would freeze. The oceans would be frozen solid. Wow! Oceans frozen solid. So that's summer and winter on Tarkov. But what about the other seasons? What about spring and autumn? Well, that's the amazing thing. You have these extreme winters and summers on Tarkov, but the spring and autumn are really quite pleasant. Average temperatures are like... 25 degrees Celsius. So 25 degrees is like Hong Kong in November. That's a nice temperature. Exactly. OK, well, certainly an interesting place, Tarkov. Right, well, it's also an exciting time for some of our listeners because they've signed up for one of our adventure camps. Now, I hope you don't mind me telling everyone, but Trillian, you actually attended our adventure camp when you were a teenager a few years back, didn't you? Yes, that's right. You're making me feel old. So what's the one thing you wish you had taken with you on the camp? Hmm, uh, good question. Sunscreen. Lots of sunscreen. One day, I remember, 
We spent the morning in the swimming pool, and I forgot to bring any. I got so burnt. I hope you remind parents to give their kids sunscreen. We'll certainly remind them to bring sunscreen then. Marvin, you help us at the camp on occasion. What would you recommend that kids bring to adventure camp? Well, let me see. I remember one boy last year turned up in his school uniform with smart shoes, and we had to call his mum and tell her to bring him comfortable clothes for doing exercise in, and sport shoes. So I would definitely say those two things: comfortable clothes and sport shoes. And I can help with telling kids what not to bring: a mobile phone. We have a strict no mobile phone policy at the camp. The adventure camp is a no mobile phone zone. Yeah, and I think the no mobile phone policy is great for kids. Without their mobile phones, they can really focus on the activities at hand. Now, one other thing before we go, it's the Star Pod Open Day coming up soon, later this month. It will be on the twenty fifth of April, and I am happy to announce. That the mystery special guest for the Star Pod Open Day is none other than Trillian Choi. Thank you, Trillian. So, if any of our listeners want to meet me, come to the Star Pod Open Day on.、Uh, sorry, when was it? The twenty fifth of April. Exactly. Yes, it should be a great day. Now, just in case our listeners need reminding. Trillian is an astronaut, so it's a chance for you kids to meet a real, live astronaut. Yes, I'm looking forward to answering all your questions. Trillian is famous because she was, wait till I get this right, the sixth female Asian astronaut. Yes, it is quite a mouthful, but I am actually very proud of that. I was indeed only the sixth female Asian astronaut. To go into space, and Trillian is also famous, of course, for being a gold medalist at the Olympics. Yes, that's right. That must have been a proud moment, winning at the Olympics. Yes, it was. It really was. But that was many moons ago now, though. Yes. Well, anyway, come and speak to Trillian at the open day and hear more of her stories. Okay. So thank you to both my guests today. And we hope to see you soon at StarPod. Bye for now. That is the end of the listening component of this paper. You will now have one hour and fifteen minutes to complete the written tasks in either Part B one or Part B two. An announcement will be made when time is up. Take off your earphones now and turn off the radio. 各位听众，你而家听紧嘅系 FM 九十四点八至九十六点九，香港电台第二台。刚啱听过嘅系香港中学文凭考试英国语文试卷三领天及综合能力考核。一阵十一点新闻之后，将会播出《风骚快活人》节目，大家可以继续留意收听。新闻前同大家睇睇天气，现时嘅室外气温二十五度，相对湿度百分之六十九。